Have you heard of a type of story called Voyage and Return? Of course, we could say that all stories involve a trip and then some kind of return home, sometimes literally, but quite often metaphorically. But this is a very specific plot type that illustrates what I think is a fundamental key to the process of renewal. It's about how we recover the passion for life, readjust our priorities in the road of life, and shed the parts of ourselves that would hinder or hold us back from individual psychological or communal success and flourishing. Hello. Marty, you didn't fall asleep, did you? Uh, Doc. Uh, no. We might think of it as an instantiation of the cosmic pattern of death and renewal, or the juxtaposition of the waking world with the dream world. A typical voyage and return story will look like this. We usually encounter a protagonist that has fallen into some kind of stagnation, sleeplessness, boredom, a rut, or stasis. And even Steigand. Alice, will you kindly pay attention to your history lesson? Alice is bored with her schooling and pines for an imaginary world where everything is the opposite or mirror of our world. If I had a world of my own, everything would be nonsense. And contrary-wise, what it is, it wouldn't be. And what it wouldn't be, it would. Andy Dufresne is having trouble with his marriage and contemplates committing a crime of passion. Dorothy finds the world of Kansas stale and predictable and hints at the desire for more to the traveling salesman. Marty McFly is stuck in a family that consistently fails to live up to their potential and constantly underachieves in life. We're gonna have to eat this cake by ourselves. Your Uncle Joey didn't make parole again. See you later, Pop. Woo! Time to change that oil. <laughs> Chuck from Castaway is unable to relate to the people around him as people, instead treating them as means to his ends, and lives in devotion to the great god of time. Allow ourselves the sin of losing track of time. Neo senses that something is not right in the world in which he lives and works, and falls asleep in his apartment. The children, sent to the old house in the country to escape the bombs falling on London, find themselves bored and unsatisfied with their options for passing time on a rainy day and decide to play hide and seek. We could play hide and seek. Come on, Peter, please. At this point, something unexpected happens and our protagonists fall into another world. Alice goes down the rabbit hole. Andy is arrested for a murder that he contemplated but did not commit. Marty accidentally winds up going back in time to 1955. Chuck winds up on a deserted island somewhere in the vast Pacific Ocean alone. Dorothy gets hit on the head and whisked away to an unconscious dreamland called Oz. Neo is given a choice to take the red pill and exit the Matrix. I imagine that right now you're feeling a bit like Alice, tumbling down the rabbit hole. Lucy and the other children attempt to hide in a wardrobe and discover that it leads to the snowy land of Narnia. The key commonality here to all of these examples is that the protagonist falls or is abducted into this other world, almost like the way sleep takes us at some point at the end of the day, whether we want it to or not, and transports us to this dream world regardless of our intentions. But one thing we can't ignore in this plot type is how closely this fall into the dream world, or we might say the world of the upside down, symbolizes a death and second birth. Just look at the violence of this plane crash and the infant-like quality of Chuck born anew in this special world of strange rules, requiring him to learn to survive from scratch. The pill you took is part of a trace program. What does that mean? It means buckle your seatbelt, Dorothy, because Kansas is going bye-bye. How would you know the difference between the dream world and the real world? Just like Neo here in The Matrix, using his real eyes and real muscles for the first time. Or the infant symbolism associated with the new fish, including Andy Dufresne, as they enter Shawshank Prison. They march you in naked as the day you were born. But at the same time, this other world quite often exhibits all the qualities of a dreamland. Dorothy finds color 
for the first time. Alice finds everything inverted. What is usually big is small, and what is small is big, and what is usually right side up is upside down. Just as the moon is a reflection of the sun, this upside down world, this dream world, is a mirror image of the waking world. And there'll be a glorious fire with, with, with toast and, and tea and cakes, and, and perhaps we'll even break into the sardines. Well, I suppose I could come for a little while. <laughs> At first, this other world is actually quite magical, and our heroes learn how to survive and even thrive rather quickly, perhaps even acquiring some initial companions or friends. Andy meets Red. Lucy has tea with Mr. Tumnus. Chuck finds Wilson. Marty finds the 1955 version of Doc Brown. And Dorothy meets a lion, scarecrow, and tin man. Let's hurry! Yes, let's run! <laughs> But this initial success draws the attention of other entities in this strange land. Bullies or nephros characters that have their own agendas in this upside down world. Andy Dufresne attracts the attention of the sisters. Neo is betrayed by Cypher, Lucy by Edmund. And we get a hint that in this underworld there is in fact an upside down ruler, a Luciferian figure, a snake that eats the dead and seeks to steal the names of our protagonists, locking them into non-identity, forever slaves in the underworld. This ruler of the underworld desires to trap our protagonists into the upside down. Like the waves that prevent Chuck from leaving the island, these upside down figures use every trick in their arsenal to steal the identity of the hero and push them deeper and deeper down into death. The warden throws Andy into the hole, the white witch stakes her claim on Edmund, and the hero has to confront the reality of death. We got a situation here. I tell you, son, this thing really came along and knocked my wind out. The right thing to do. It's hard to know what that is. I have to know if what you told to frame was the truth. Absolutely. I'm sure by now you've heard. Man that young. Less than a year to go, trying to escape. I'm done. Everything stops. Nothing stops. Well, you will do the hardest time there is. And this is the most fascinating part. What is the one thing that is needed to escape the upside down. Hope, it seems, is constantly juxtaposed with despair. Brooks abandons hope and takes the other way out. Chuck attempts to do the same thing, only failing due to a weak tree branch, and Marty is in danger of being erased from existence. Erased from existence. So Chuck finds hope in the form of these wings, and Andy finds hope in the form of music, and Red avoids Brooks' fate thanks to the hope given to him by Andy. It is as if our heroes are little seeds sent down into the murky, upside-down depths of this underworld with a purpose, get busy living or get busy dying. Either gather in the nutrients around them and sprout up like the stalk of an organic plant form, a tree, a vine, a flower, or allow themselves to be consumed by the earth, decaying down into nothingness. The final escape then from the clutches of the king or queen of the underworld must be done on the wings of hope, using spirit. And our heroes are reborn, awakening anew, back into our world, the world of the right side up, this world, somehow changed, having learned to resist the temptations of death and eternal sleep, and thus renewed to forge ahead in life and to new beginnings. 
sleep and death have now been left behind and our heroes step out into the new morning, into the bright sunlight of the day.